Okay, this video is going to kind of wrap up some of the other families involved uh, in the periodic table. This next large family after group two is group three, and it's called the transition metals. Uh, the transition metals are going to be a fairly large group in the center of the periodic table. They also incorporate the two bottom uh, rows of elements. Uh, let's see. They form a bridge between the left side, which is very reactive, and the less reactive right side because they're right there in the center of the periodic table. This is where you're going to find iron, you're going to find um, tungsten, mercury, you're going to find copper, zinc, um, gold, and silver. Uh, they're very good conductors of electricity because they are all metals, so they're going to they're going to exhibit the properties of metals such as malleability, ductility, good conductors of electricity, and thermal um, energy. And most of them are going to be shiny. They also are all metals except, and they're all solids at room temp except for mercury that will be a uh, liquid at room temp. So that's your only one that's a liquid at room temp. Um, Let's see what else. Valence. They're going to have, these guys are going to be a little bit more tricky because their valence is going to vary from like 1 to 2. Um, typically group 1 has 1 valence, group 2 has 2 valence. The boron group, which is um, group 13, has um, 3 valence. The transition metals are going to have about 1 to 2 valence. So um, I will have to tell you what their valence will be on a future test. Um, the popular ones in this uh, category are going to be, uh, let's see, iron, mercury, we'll talk about all these guys, zinc, titanium I'll talk about, that's what that ring is for. Um, we'll also talk about tungsten, which is in uh, light bulbs, it's the wire inside light bulbs. Uh, but we also have two rows at the bottom that's also involved with transition metals, and that's the lanthanide and actinide series. It's called the lanthanide series because it starts with the element lanthium, and it's called the actinide series because it starts with the element act actinum. Um, the lanthium is the number 57, which you'll see. It doesn't show you on this particular picture, but you'll see it on the periodic table you have, especially that green one that I gave you in class. And then actinum is number 89, so it's right before this number 90 thorium. But the lanthanide and actinide series are called rare earth metals. Um, they're periods... Um, they're in period six and seven, so you actually insert them in period six and seven, but remember I told you that that would make the periodic table really large. So we put the lanthanide and actinide series on the bottom because they are rare earth metals, meaning it took us a while to find them. But they also have a lot of man-made elements, such as the ones that are starred on the bottom. Those are all going to be man-made elements. Um, they're going to be soft and malleable, like typical metals, shiny with, um, with some conductivity. They conduct electricity and probably thermal conductivity because they are metals. Um, the actinides, which is the bottom row, are going to exist in very small amounts, except for thorium, which is number 90. Uh, uranium you're going to find in small amounts. It's also going to decay, uh, radi goes through radioactive decay, but they also... Um, uh, have in the actinite series, that's where you're going to find primarily um, a lot of your uh, man-made elements. And that's what I just said, man-made elements are here. After uranium, uranium is the last naturally occurring element, and after that, they're pretty much all, they are all man-made, or they're a product of radioactive decay, uh, so they're not natural, they're, they're a part of decay. Heading towards the right-hand side of the periodic table, we have what's called the boron family. The boron family is going to be the group name, and the location of the periodic table is all the elements under the boron element. Um, the group number is number 13 on the periodic table, but you'll often he hear me refer to it as group number 3. In this family, we have boron, aluminum, gallium, indium, and thallium. Uh, in the boron family, the characteristics are they have one metalloid, which is actually boron, and then four metals below that. Aluminum is on the zigzag, but remember, aluminum is a metal. In the boron family, they have three valence, so it makes them reactive, but not as much as group one and two, because these elements have to find other atoms that are willing to take all three of their valence. So if aluminum is looking around, it's got three in its valence, it needs to find another atom that will take 
its three valence. It just can't give away half of the those three. It has to give away all three. So that's the boron family. And we'll talk maybe a little bit more, investigate gallium and aluminum and boron. Those would be the popular ones in the family that we would talk about. Um, as far as solids, liquids, like gases go, these are going to be all solids. And the properties are going to have uh, the metals, aluminum, gallium, indium, and thallium are going to have properties like metal. And boron is going to have some properties um, that keep it out of the metal category. So perhaps it will have some non-metal um, uh, characteristics. Another mixed family is going to be the carbon family. Carbon's in this family. Silicon's in this family. Germanium, tin and lead. A couple characteristics about this unique family. It's under the carbon element. It's group number 14, but often you'll hear me refer to it as uh, 4 because it has 4 valence. The carbon family has one nonmetal, which is carbon. It has two metalloids, which is silicon and germanium, and it has two metals, which is tin and uh, lead. Four valence makes it kind of in the middle of the road as far as obtaining eight go. It's kind of right in the middle. It could it could react or not. It's not going to be that reactive. Um, the reactivity is going to vary. So this is um, group 14, four valence. Um, they're all going to be solids as well. And the properties are going to have all kinds of properties. Carbon's going to be all nonmetal properties, not shiny Um it's not going to be a good conductor. The metalloids like silicon. Silicon um, is used in a lot of electronics, so it probably conducts electricity. Um, germanium is the other metalloid. As far as metals go, tin and lead are your two metals, so they're going to be shinier. They're going to conduct electricity. Group 15 is labeled the nitrogen family. <clears throat> it's going to be labeled according to the top element similar to how the carbon and boron family are also named. Notice it is right next to the carbon family, uh, four uh, columns away from the end on the right. The elements that are in this group are nitrogen, phosphorus, arsenic, antimony, and bismuth. These elements consist of two nonmetals, two metalloids, and a metal. The nonmetals are nitrogen and phosphorus. The two metalloids are arsenic and antimony, while the last metal is bismuth. The valence of this family will be 5, so we're starting to see more uh, reactivity. These elements are going to want to obtain electrons. It's too, it requires too much energy to remove 5 valence, so they're going to seek 3 valence to obtain their full outer set of 8. Uh, you can you can see from this diagram over on the uh, right hand side that nitrogen has five valence in its outermost ring. It wants to bond with another element, or another metal, such as an alkali or alkaline earth. It could also bond with um, somebody from the boron family, um, but it could also bond with itself. And for instance, nitrogen can bond with itself and share. Um, they're outer electrons, and you'll learn about covalent bonding in the next chapter. But when that happens, you get a diatomic molecule, and di means two, two atoms that bond together that are of the same element. So in this case, um, you're going to get a triple bond with nitrogen bonding to itself. On the other side, group number 16 is the oxygen family. The oxygen family consists of three metals, nonmetals, and two metalloids. The nonmetals are oxygen, sulfur, and selenium, and the two metalloids are tellurium and polonium. Uh, let's see, they are going to be two, three, three columns away from the end. Um, these guys are going to have a valence of six, so we're starting to get more and more reactive. They want two more electrons to fill their outer valence, so you notice my picture again. I have six arrows pointing to the six outer valence electrons. Uh, they can obtain electrons from anyone. Uh, they can obtain them from hydrogen. They can obtain them from alkali metals or even um, alkaline earth or even the boron family again. Um, again, just like the nitrogen family, uh, oxygen family can bond to itself. For instance, oxygen would bond to itself and you would get oxygen gas. This is again called a diatomic molecule when you have two atoms of the same element bonding together. If oxygen bonds to itself, it'll form a double bond and that is O2 is the formula and that's oxygen gas. 
Um, as far as popular ones in the oxygen family, and then I'll go back to the nitrogen family, oxygen would be 21% um, of the air that you breathe. Uh, if the levels drop down to 17%, then we would all die. And if the levels uh, rise to 25%, the atmosphere could blow up. O3, if you have three oxygens bonding together, that's called ozone. And that's what you see in the outer um, atmospheric levels. Um, sulfur is also popular. We know about sulfur. It's a yellow power, smells like rotten eggs. Sulfur is used in gunpowder. Um, but it, so it's also on the head of matches and on the box you get phosphorus. We'll talk about that. That's in the nitrogen family. Um, let's see. Polonium I'm also going to talk about in class. Uh, it is a radioactive element and remind me to talk about that in class. Go back to the nitrogen family. Nitrogen is going to be popular. And nitrogen is 78% of the air you breathe. Um, nitrogen is very important in fertilizers. It's also in laughing gas, like the gas that they would give you if they're going to do dental work. Phosphorus is also flammable. Um, it's used in gunpowder. It's actually the strip on a matchbox. Um, there's red phosphorus, white phosphorus. A lot of them are used in bombs for phosphorus. We'll have whoever did phosphorus talk to us during class. And those are pretty much the only two in the nitrogen family that I think are popular. Um, so we have three more families to discuss. That's going to be in another uh, video. And um, thank you very much for your attention in this video. And I look forward to seeing you in class.